heat capacity. Well, heat capacity is so important in determining the values of internal energy and uh, enthalpy that it's important that we understand some of its general properties. So first of all, we should understand that heat capacity uh, is in general a measure of how good a molecule is at storing energy. Okay, and so if you think about how a molecule could store energy or how a compound could store energy, we can use kinetic energy. So if we look at, imagine some of the nitrogen molecules in this room, we know they're flying around, so they've all, each molecule has energy one half mb squared. But remember that nitrogen is diatomic, and so it's also rotating and vibrating. And the rotational motion is purely kinetic, but a vibration, you're stretching the bond as well as moving the atoms, so it also has a potential component. And we also know that um, real substances have intermolecular forces, and so if we pull molecules apart from each other, that increases potential energy. It's like lifting uh, a ball away from the surface of the Earth. We have to do work, so there's potential energy that we're increasing if we do that. So uh, heat capacity is basically a measure of a compound's uh, ability to store energy in these two ways. So it's not surprising then that there is some change in heat capacity as a function of temperature. Now, if we just change the temperature a small amount, we might see that it's approximately constant. But if what if we went all the way from room temperature down to absolute zero kelvins? Okay. Well, in this case, we would see a dramatic change. And the reason is, is that if we get close to absolute zero, molecules are locked in their lowest quantum state. And that's the lowest uh, state for motion of electrons around the molecules lowest quantum state for vibration and rotation as well. And so um, and as they get colder and colder, they eventually um, are locked in a solid crystal lattice. And they're still vibrating, but they're vibrating in their lowest quantum state. And so because they're locked in that lowest state, they can't store energy. And so the heat capacity goes to zero as we get to zero kelvins. Okay. Now at this point, it would be useful to know what are what are typical values for heat capacity? And so I've got this table here, and all of these are approximations, but uh, certainly if you just want an answer to one sig fig, they'll, they'll work perfectly fine. So, uh, and these are, these are uh, approximations that are true at around room temperature. So solid metals around 3R, uh, monatomic gases here at 3 halves R, and light diatomic gases here at 3 halves R. And uh, the reason that these are uh, fractions of R is there's a theory in physics or a theorem in physics called the equipartition theorem that says you should be able to once you unlock all your modes. So not when you're at absolute zero, but when you're in room temperature, you should be able to have one half R of heat capacity per mode of motion. And if you think about a monatomic gas, it can't spin, it, can, it can't rotate because it's just a, it's a point. Uh, you can't um, uh, vibrate because there's no bonds to vibrate, but you can translate. You can fly around the room in the X, Y, and Z dimensions, and each of those is a mode of motion. So you have three halves R for your heat capacity. Uh, uh, light diatomic gases also throw in um, a, uh, a rotational, some rotational modes of motion. It turns out at room temperature, the vibrational modes are still roughly locked out for most gases. So this is basically the two vibrational modes added to the original translational modes. Anyway, if you want to do a heat capacity, if you need a heat capacity and you don't have an exact value, you can use these rules of thumb if you're near room temperature. You can go back and forth between Cp and Cv using this rule if you have an ideal gas. We're going to derive this later, but for now you can go ahead and use it before we derive it. By the way, I haven't mentioned what these bars are. And let me go ahead and just circle one of these bars here. Uh, this is just meaning per mole. Okay, and so we're going to use over bars consistently. Not, we're not going to ever use them for averages. Uh, in my lecture, we're always going to use them to mean per mole. Okay, and finally, as we mentioned, uh, if we go to absolute zero, 
the heat capacity goes to zero as well. Okay, so let's look at how to use a heat capacity in a problem. Okay. Well, let's see, let's go ahead and write a general equation and see if we can see if it's related to this problem. So du we know is Cb dt plus pi t dv. All right, so we know that's always true. And then we look at our problem and say, oh, wait a minute, look at this. We're working at constant volume. So that allows us to cross off this term since there's no change in volume. So we don't have to worry about the pi t term. And then we can integrate both sides. And we get that delta u is just equal to this interval. So we're going to integrate from the original temperature, the new temperature, the value of the heat capacity over temp uh, integrated through temperature. And the details of that integral will be different for every problem because if we're integrating over a small temperature range, so if delta T is very small, then the heat capacity is not going to change very much. And if CV is approximately constant, we can just pull it right outside that interval. So in this case, delta U is just going to be CV. And then we're going to have the integral of dt, which is delta t, t2 minus t1. If delta t is large, though, we really can't do that. We'll have to, we'll have to actually do the integral. So to do the integral, we need CV is a function of T, so we can put the whole thing in terms of temperature and have a one variable problem. Okay, so let's do some examples. So here we're asked how much U changes if we heat up some oxygen gas and we're doing it in a sealed box. So we'll go back to the original equation. So we always write the general one first before we jump into anything specific so we don't misapply. Okay, and we see, oh, it's a sealed box. Well, if it's a sealed box, that implies that the volume is constant. Okay, and if we look at this, we're going from 298 to 308, that's a pretty small temperature range, and we're only really doing this to one sig fig, so we can make some approximations here. Let's go ahead and assume Let's go ahead and assume that CV is constant. Because of the small temperature range and the fact that we actually don't need any kind of precision in this problem. So we integrate delta U. And as we saw earlier, we're just going to pull the CV right outside the integral. Okay, and just to jump back a minute ago, we, we don't have to go to Atkins because we can just use an approximate value for CV. And we saw earlier that if we had a light diatomic gas and that describes oxygen, we can use 5 half Rs as our molar heat capacity. And what we need is the heat capacity, not the molar heat capacity. So if we take the number of moles of oxygen, oops, let me undo that. Uh, take the molar heat capacity, multiply it by a number of moles, that will give us our heat capacity. And so delta U, just to plug in some numbers to get a number at the end, we have three moles. And notice that we uh, plug in units whenever we plug in uh, numbers. So we have five halves R. So five halves. 8.314. If 
can use any units we want, but since we're trying to get an energy, it's more conventional to use the, uh, the joule form of R. And we see a delta T of 10 kelvins. All right, so we check our kelvins, cancel our kelvins, our moles, cancel our moles. And so we're going to end up with units of just energy. And so we've got 3 times 5 times 10. So we've got 150. Uh, we have 150 divided by um, 2. So we multiply that times r, we end up with uh, 623, and we just needed one sig fig, so we'll say 600 joules. And there's our answer. Okay. Let's do one more example that's a little more complicated. This is sort of a, almost a general chemistry example. The next one will be a little more complicated. Here, we're heating nitrogen from 100 degrees to 300, and we're supposed to calculate delta H and just delta H per, per mole. We, we don't really need to know how much nitrogen there is because we're just wondering what the delta H is per mole. All right, so we write out our fundamental equation. GH is equal to CPDT. That's it. UT. CP. All right, and we see that we're doing it at a specific fixed pressure. And so this is just like the other problem. There's no change in pressure, so that term goes to zero, and we're just dealing with the CP term. And since we want to calculate the molar heat capacity, let's just divide everything through by the number of moles. And so we can make this one, oops, we can make this one also per mole. Oh, maybe I can't. So we divide through by the number of moles, and that gives us uh, gives us an equation we can use. So we'll go ahead and integrate this. And when we do this, we see that we're a little bit stuck at first because we know that uh, well, this, the left-hand side is trivial, but on the right-hand side, we need to have heat capacity as a function of temperature because we're we're changing by by 200 kelvins here, and so we we really it would be too much of an approximation to say that the heat capacity over that greater range is constant, and so we're going to have to integrate from T1 to T2, and we have to have Cp as a function of temperature. Fortunately for us. There are tabulated um, equations for heat capacities as a function of temperature, and you've got some in the back of Atkins, and they're given in the form of these constants, A, B, and C. And basically all people have done is, is measured heat capacity at a lot of different temperatures and then seen, uh, uh, basically they could fit the data to some polynomial. And the polynomial that's used in Atkins is that Cp is going to be equal to A plus BT plus C over T squared. Okay, And the crucial thing when you do this, actually that's heat capacity per mole, the crucial thing when you do this is to uh, is to make sure that you uh, don't plug in any numbers until you're done with all your algebra and calculus. So, so just substitute this entire expression into the, into the integral. Okay, so we have delta H equal to the integral from T1 to T2, and then just put that whole expression in for Cp. So A, Bt, plus C over T2. And there's in the table in Atkins, there's a the values of A, B, and C for a bunch of different gases, and of course they're different for every for every gas. Okay, so we do the integral, and we'll do that on the next page. And we've got uh, we're integrating from T1 to T2, so we just integrate each term. 
So the A becomes an AT, and the B times D would be over 2 T squared, and the C over T squared becomes a minus C over T. And then we plug in the limits of integration. I'm going to move down here to give myself a little more space. So we've got A. And you be careful if you're a little bit out of practice on your integration. You've got to plug in these, the complete, oh, this is supposed to be a 1 over here, isn't it? I'll try to make that look a little bit more like a, like a 1. This is T1. So we're integrating from t to t1. So as I was saying, plug in the limits separately. There's a temptation, especially when you're in a rush and a test or something, to to plug in delta t in places where it's where it's really not appropriate. Right? We have to plug in the the limits to each functionality. Okay. And then we had a minus c. And then we had one over t2 minus one over t1. Okay, and all of that was equal to delta H. So at this point, it would be appropriate to, per mole, it would be appropriate to plug in the temperatures and the constants, and if you've done your calculus correctly, all the units will cancel. And that's our answer.